start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you today to speak about you and to learn about you from your sacred word. Help us to know not just things about you or things about the scriptures, to come to know you better and love you more. We can trust this time of conversation to you in the hands of our mother as we say. Hail Mary, full of grace, grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this is the third week in a row we're trying to start out this class. <laughs> You've been hit by snow twice, and the snow's on the way again tomorrow tonight, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And then next week, again. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess I'm trying to figure out, is that the class? <laughs> I teach in the wrong class. So I this is going to be an incredible class, and that was really kind of hard to get rid of it. Or it's a horrible class, and the Lord's saying, change the fashion. That's what know the end <laughs> But I decided to do last semester, we had to be the last class we met for the Gospel of Matthew. We wanted to do a bit of an Old Testament Bible discussion. What's an Old Testament work with some of that? Um, and there's different ways to approach this. I mean, again, any one of these books, you can spend a lifetime thinking about praying over the sect and going into reach for history going on. There's, there's so much to this. Um, just looking at the history of the scriptures, the way it was written, there's so much to be done. I'm going to talk about what the Mahdi do at first. You might find these things. A Mahdi will go all into what's called a biblical critical method. If you go into a most modern scripture studies, focus on this method of discussing and dissecting the scriptures. In my opinion, at least the way, the way it was done whenever I study, this is not what helped. This method is basically trying to figure, to set, to figure out what's really being said in the words here. And so it will do things like it will dissect and try to figure out um, differences in language. The difference in language between different authors of the same book, or the two books put together, um, where they're written at different time periods. Do you look at, and so it's, it's trying to dissect the different script texts we have, different versions, different manuscripts versions. Uh, remember that you know, these days, because of the printing press we have, Every Bible is basically the same as every other Bible. Um, what's written by hand is easy to skip a lot. If you ever copy anything by hand, especially for hours and hours and years of time, let's skip a word of that. Or change a word. Let's read a word. If you have a bad hand for writing, let's read something. If you're tired at night, you're falling asleep, you might change a word accidentally. And so this method compares and contrasts their manuscripts and figure out what's really being said here. And so there are times where those different phrases are argued about different different lines, different texts. To me, though, well, it can be interesting, and it can be useful. And certainly, there are times when Dr. Breckley is very helpful uh, to go into the different means, the different, different problems, discussions that are being had, different arguments. I think the problem is that we end up approaching the texts as the judge of the text. It's easy to come across the text and say, well, I'm here trying to figure out what's correct. And I'm going to judge this text. And I'm going to sit here and I'm going to figure out what this really says. And the expert then becomes me. And it's very easy to it's become then a, a teacher of the text rather than a student until the learner receives the word of God. Um, and so they're sitting here, again, it's, it's a tool we use very well. And I've seen this very well. Obedek, for example, is a master of using this method very, very well. Uh, because he's able to both discuss the way, way that different writers say, different authors say, different manuscripts say, and still be a believer and a disciple. But he's the exception. 
most people who I read this come to it and talk about it, and they'll say, well, therefore, this is what it's really being said, this is how it's really being true. And there's almost like contempt for the word, the Bible. Um, at least with a certain um, class, a certain amount of writers. Part of this you'll find for, for the book of Genesis, for example, that's what I mean, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. The Genesis through the Deuteronomy. Uh, there is what's been called the four source theory. Well, this is an example of the end of the Bible. I'm not going to do this in this method very much. I'm going to kind of you know, assume it and ignore it. If you have questions on it, I certainly can go into it if, you're, if there are questions or discussions or particular individual problems with the approach, I certainly can. Uh, they said, my main thrust of this class, I don't know if this is very helpful, but there's something called the four source theory. The Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Pentateuch, Torah in Hebrew, Pentateuch in Greek, Penta number five, a pentagram, pentagon, Pentateuch, first five books. The four source theory says there are four, four authors, four main sources. Traditionally, the Pentateuch was written by Moses. Um, and so the the scripture talks about the book of Moses, they mean the Pentateuch, they mean Genesis, Deuteronomy. Um, the four source theory says this is ridiculous, this is written at four different time periods, four different goal or the sources, and kind of stapled together, zip, uh, zippered together by some other redactor, some other author, put and pasted them together many, many, many years later. And it was the Moses' as a name as a a stamp of authority. And so they'll say there is the, uh, the Yahweh's source. They'll say there is the law source. The law source will say there is the biblical source, the priest code. Um, they'll say there is, let's, let's see the fourth one, there's Yahweh and there's another title for God there. Elohim. And so the way the theory goes is it says that if you look at look, there's different languages being used for God, different titles being used for God, and therefore there's are different authors. There's different thrusts, different descriptions, different ideas, therefore there's different authors. Well, I came across, and I was, it's hilarious to me, I study this, I study this, um, and if you register that, I can bring you to the next class. Somebody applied this force for theory to the book. <laughs> and they use the exact same arguments you'll find by very serious scripture scholars to prove the way that Pooh was written by four sources. Because at times he's called Edward the Bear, at times he's called Sir Pooh the Bear, there are times he's, he's, he's the hero of the story, at times he's the fool of the story. Therefore, there must be different sources and different authors putting this together. It cannot be the same author the way that Pooh. And it's, it's written in this, this very high falutin, starly, scholarly language. Ridiculously and very funny. Um, I mean, I haven't passed it on to you if you're on the use at some point. Um, just, but take that same theory. You have to, if you read it, use one of them, I'll give it to you. Um, take that same theory, imagine apply it to the Bible. Where someone comes along and says, these can't really be by Moses, only a fool believes by Moses, only a fool believes written by author, must be different authors because of these reasons. And to me, these reasons at the end are really kind of spacious. Could be true. Does it make a huge difference? Not really. But it seems to be a waste of time and effort to dissect that. Um, just because in the end, what we're doing that is saying, we're so smart because we know this. And then you actually end up missing what's actually being said. And so, so my approach is going to be Take the scripture as it is, the author is God, that's the bottom line. Um, he uses human beings to write it, he uses human talents. Um, like I said, if, if there are questions or you want to go more into some of the more historical stuff, some of the more theoretical stuff, I'm not going to have to, I'm not going to to it. But I just think it's the main thrust of this, uh, for me to go into, another example that showed me less, 
was there was this uh, uh, this chart on review. And this was done very seriously. And I'm not sure why, but that's me. Uh, this chart we were given talking about every appearance, uh, this, it was comparing five or six different um, apparitions of angels. The angels come and appear to a lay woman and then um, her, her announced her as going to be, give birth to a, a son or give birth to a special child, it's going to be a particular reference to this the story in history. It's imperative. And the idea behind it was the authors of each of, of these verses was borrowing from and perhaps embellishing. And so it's saying, look at the look at this, this every person has these five points. Where you have, you know, there's the fear, then there's the uh, when it approaches, then there's the problem is you look closer. I mean, and the first one is it sounds you know, very scholarly, it sounds you know, very scary, it sounds very you know, intelligent. And you look at the little closer at the chart. Not one of these apparitions have all five points. Some had three, some had two, some had one. They're all shoved together as this chart, and they all follow, they follow the same scheme. And this is a, again, a scholarly apparatus of theory, which is used, you know, again, done well is fine, but done poorly it's used to imply there's a balance from the You know, can we really believe, we really trust, what really happened? Well, no. Wink, wink, that would the authors say if they want us to say these things, but really it's because they were a priest trying to get power over the people. They were, they were saying they discovered this book, but really it was, you know, these priests over there, wink, wink, wink. But really it was this guy who came in these laws were custom, they would change, and they put together, and they said it was Paul to Moses, but that was just some later guy putting it together. So, again, if you can have a theory that can take five different things, and one of them fits into this, this scheme you're saying fit into, okay, not one, not one in all five points. Of the five examples they gave, not one fit into um, That seems to me to be less than helpful. Um, Interesting in its own right, but again, for the purposes of this class, I'm not sure it's the best approach. So the approach I'm going to take is not this. Um, I'm also going to bring some historical stuff, and as appropriate for the context, for to bring up what's happening historically um, when it's appropriate. But this is more scholarly kind of thing, and if this is what we're looking for, I apologize. Uh, I have a particular bias against this. I'm old fashioned, I'm old to my. But I said, if there are questions or, or concerns you have, feel free to bring them up, we'll the best answer. Um, but again, for, to, to my, my understanding, the best way to look at it is to say, this is true. There's things we learn from here, what can we learn from, what's God telling us? Um, Naturally, of course, there's so much to this. It's so, so rich, so deep. I can't cover everything. That's big issues. So I'm going to leave, so some people are going to say, why do you leave with this, this scripture verse? Because I picked and chose. <laughs> you know, there not be a, there's probably not going to be a very deep reason for it. I'm going to pick out highlights. And so, you're going to be, so some of you are going to be disappointed and miss some of your favorite stories. Um, the, for the most part, you know, where I, where I think people know the story pretty well, I'm probably not going to have us read it verse by verse. Let's talk about today. Let's talk about the first two chapters of Genesis. So that's the creation story, the story of Adam and Eve, and the fall. For the most part, I think we know that pretty well. So, so great part verse by verse, but I'm not sure if it's really helpful. I think more, more broad themes and more broad ideas are more helpful for these things. For some of the more um, difficult or interesting passages, maybe we'll go and break it at verse by verse. Um, today, though, that's a, my approach is more of broad themes. And so we're going to look at you know, what does Genesis teach us about these first two chapters? What does it say about God? So what are, we, what are we actually learning about God here? Who God is, 
what he does for us. Who is God? Creator. He's creator, yeah. So as we look at that, we look at who is man, who's poor Adam and Eve. Then we're going to point to how does it point forward then to the Savior and his cross. Those are kind of the three main themes for tonight, looking at these first two chapters. Um, as I said, an actor class would tell me that was horrible to do that again. Or that was the best thing since sliced bread for us to do. Question on that so far? Okay. So what does Genesis, these first three chapters, Say about that. We have to realize we're being given a relation to history. We're being told a story. This is like when you're literally you sit you sit in your grandparents and you say, Tell me what it was like when your when mom and dad were. And they're like, oh, I remember this one time when your mother, she was such a bad girl. I not believe what she did. You know. You learn your family history. You learn your parents' sorrow. You learn about your grandparents' sorrow. There's a lot, though, that's, that's not, it's not spelled out very clearly. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not a treatise of, you know, everything that you hear about your mother. You, you pull from it. You learn from it. By hearing and learning the story and the vision and the um, you should learn the personality of your parents, you know, your grandparents, what they tell it. And, and so this is the, the context. And traditionally, the context of this was this was, again, revealed to Moses, which means this is a people, the people who have heard this are coming out of slavery, out of some segregation of foreign peoples, being claimed by God. Now, the state of the Moses is being told, this is your family history of who you are, of who your God is. This is how you serve and love and follow. And because it's historical, because it, it, it's stories, right? It's not like you're going to find an index and you're going to find, okay, these are the five qualities of God. It's not a cabinet. Here's how you do this. Every book, every story has its own different emphasis, its own different themes, its own different purpose. That's not going to be you know, a scientific or a, 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 um, a kind of, not a cabinet, not a scientific or scientific trees or a cabinet. But it's going to be questions on who is God, how do you follow him, what's it mean, you learn by stories. This is how Abraham followed God, now this is how I follow God too. This is what God told us and loved him because he came to us and posted and spoke to us. It's very, it's, it's very, very different and also very, very beautiful. Because the difference is not the, the purpose of that is to a book. That is to a person. See, through Moses, through the other authors, the prophets, we're sitting on that God's feet. We're hearing stories from God. And God's talking and saying, okay, let me tell you what I did. Let me tell you who I am. Let me tell you who you are. Let me tell you what I want you to do. And he does through the stories. He does through the ways everyone in this room, not everyone in this room in history, but everybody that's interested in, in science, everyone's interested in math. Everyone knows stories. When Christ comes, the thousand years after Moses, he teaches about parables, he teaches about stories. He comes and he says, this is who I am. So that my feet learn from me. Live with me. The apostles say, Lord, how do you be saved? Come and see. Where are you staying? Come follow me. He doesn't begin by saying, let me talk to you about the truth. He says, come and see. And the verse is, this is, what it means then is we don't have to be I mean, build See, part of the problem with the less often the interpretation of Scripture, you try to take each piece as its own separate thing. What does Deuteronomy say about God? What does Ness say about God? This is one big story, it's one library. 
And so you can't separate what Matthew said about God from what Christ You can't separate what Christ did on the cross from what Christ did in the garden. You can't separate um, the story of Emmaus, you know, where, where Christ walks with the apostles and reveals to them who he is, the breaking of the bread, with this liberation from the people of Egypt. Now, we head in sequentially, we've learned a piece at a time. And we build it, we have to build all that, we have to take it in context. The context then isn't just the context, its own niche, and what was being said at the time in history, what was being, whether the apostles would stand by those words, what would, what would have been those meaning of those words in Hebrew, but also in the whole Bible. And so, the foundation is in these first Genesis. Everything else builds off. Everything else flows from this and points back to it. You can't forget these books, you can't ignore these books, but these have to be the foundation. And so it begins at the beginning. <laughs> In Hebrew, book Genesis is a Greek word. It means gen generation. Um, to create, to beget. First, more the genealogies. In, in Hebrew, it's not Genesis. Uh, it's creation. The creation. So this is the creation story. The very first thing that we learn about God is start with the beginning. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a promised wasteland, the earth covered the abyss, well, the mighty was filled with the waters. Who's read Greek or Roman or other creation myths? I guess you could think of what was the Moana, what was the, uh, the, 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 not the, uh, the, the Polynesian cartoons, or something maybe they've seen, the little kids have seen that. Uh, the, the creation of the, of the, of the no, you're just making it on Okay, so <laughs> I was thinking you might have seen that little Katie. Oh, Moana? Moana. Yeah. Yeah. The cartoons of the Polynesian yeah. creation yeah, myths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. They're all very similar. Yeah. yeah. How, how do they all begin? Lakota had a creation of two and a trickster. The trickster, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're all very similar. And how did they begin? How did the Greeks or the Romans, the Polynesians, the Lakotas begin? There's nothing more at the beginning. Darkness. Darkness. Norm, and normally the, the earth is created from an animal or a giant yeah. or a, you know, yeah. it's, it's not this something. Mm. They don't really go back. See, other myths, it always begins with there was a cow or a giant or these things, the giant died, the mountain put over his teeth, and the blood became rivers, and the, it always begins with something. Not so this. In the beginning, there's God. And God doesn't die to create for himself. In other myths, you know, the creation comes from the death of something. These are his ribs, or those things are his, his toenails, those things are his teeth. Not this. The beginning God creates. Okay, well, who's God? Where did he come from? The beginning God creates. What we're being told here is God is the beginning. A source and origin of all things. Nothing's before God. God always is, always was, always will be. This becomes more and more clear in later chapters. When God reveals his name to us. At the very beginning, it begins with the stark fact that God simply was and God created. This is a very sharp start when we are so used to it. We go, of course. Duh, of course. Well, what else? But to, to any of the most ancient people reading this, the way they meant, where did he get this stuff? Where, where did he find the cow and kill the cow? Where did he make the legs from? Where did he, what liquid did he form those things from? The Jews said, no, he just, he said it, it is. 
everything flows from his very will, his willpower. There's nothing before him. He's not taking something else. See, the other ancient gods, the descriptions, they were manufacturers. The way a artist takes raw and manufactures a statue. Or a carpenter manufactures a tailor. Take a tree by the first. They're, they're big human beings. God, Yahweh is different. God, Elohim here, and the period of this first book, it's Elohim, is different. Because God is there. And he doesn't create himself. He doesn't create from anything else. He doesn't have to take. He's not a manufacturer. He's a creator. He creates from nothing. It's a very, very different kind of power. Very, very different kind of authority. Very, very different kind of love. He's not bored. He's, he loves. He wills. He doesn't be. This is a sign of, I think I thought this last time. What's interesting about the word for God here? I look here. Remember? What's the difference between a, a, what's the difference between a, a seraph and seraphim? Or a cherub and a cherubim? Multiples. So there's already a hint of Trinity. Again, you don't see this until Christ comes. But the word for God is plural. It's a plural word. Even though the, the descriptions and the never talks about he, it's always seen to Literally, this would be in the beginning, the gods, he created the heaven. In the beginning, the gods, he said this. The gods, he is one. So when you have this hint of the Trinity, that there's something so immense, so powerful about God. Interesting, um, again, something that um, you see the very beginning, there is this hint. Of, of, of who the Lord is, his very nature. At this point, though, it's not real to us, it's simply there as in the back. So God the Creator, words of all things, and the fact is, everything is good at the beginning. Seven times the Lord looks over creation, examines it. Emphasizing over and over again, creation's good. It's good, it's good, it's good. The sixth time, it's, it's a different word being used, seven times different word being used. Sixth time, it's very good. And when is it very good? The man. Is it very good, the man? But this flesh weighs me down. <laughs> if only I weren't, you know, these, these dark thoughts, these dark thoughts, whatever it might be, these weak bones of mine. Back line. The thorn, the thistle that grew up in my garden that kept me from having a good harvest. The snow that kept me from going to teach plants. <laughs> Burn it, snow. <laughs> no. Here, it's all good. It's all good because then, therefore, we're saying, therefore, then, God is good. Creation is good. Evil, then, is very different in the Bible than it is in other myths. In other myths, evil is equal opposite force. Not in the Bible. Evil is said in parasite. It's something broken, like this is something lacking. Evil is not created. Evil is the destruction of creation. Evil happens when somebody comes along and takes away from God. 
Someone breaks what God does. Someone destroys what God does. Someone rebels against God. Then comes evil. When there's rebellion and destruction, then comes evil. And so therefore, not, it's not we haven't come to it yet, but it comes to the law of the commandments, evil can't make you happy. Evil can't make you wise. Evil can't make you fulfilled. Evil can't create. Because it's the opposite of creation. Evil is a parasite. Evil can only aid and mimic good, but can never be as powerful. It can never um, be a rival to God. Right? A lot of the myths, evil's a rival. There's a struggle, the strive, well, who's going to win? You don't know. No. At the beginning, we already know who wins. We already know who is all powerful, who is all good. We know. And therefore, the story that begins is a love story. We already know how everything ends. But I know where our peace is because God is good, everything is good. See how different that is? It's beautiful. Just a few simple words were told of this. We're also told that a God has a particular interest in human beings. You look around, and we've fallen into this trap more and more in our age. But people want to say, well, we're not going to be anything special. Life is cheap. If you have a slave, if you have uh, you know, they just came from slavery. Life is cheap. You know, a, a, a donkey or a horse, that, that, that was expensive. A book, well, that could be really expensive. Human life, cheap. God makes so many thinly things. You know, the oceans are more, more beautiful in some ways than human beings are. We have uh, in the New Testament, there, there is this, a famous story of the Legion, the exorcism of the Legion. And the story where uh, Christ is that repeat Muhammad from the morning, sorry. <laughs> where Christ is, goes to the pagan territory, and there's the guy possessed by the demons. And it's possessed by 2,000 demons, and they say, Let's go to the herd of swine. And they go to the herd of swine, the herd of swine, they run, run and rush off the cliff and die. And we look at them and say, Wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. Those poor pigs. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, why is the Lord killing these 2,000 pigs? Well, there's a story that later on in the Gospel of Luke where our Lord is, is hungry and sees a fig tree, not to see them for pigs. And he curses the fig tree, the fig tree dies. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> Why has Christ cursed it? It's not even time yet. <laughs> What's he doing? You know, does he has to lose his temper? He's told us, he's showing us how valuable human beings are. He's saying, well, the other thing, he's saying, you're worth more than 2,000 pigs. That's not the words of compliment says that. <laughs> But honestly, Hallmark. human beings, I mean, yes, yeah, right, Hallmark card, Valentine's Day. <laughs> You're worth 40 camels and three pigs. <laughs> Maybe even four. <laughs> you know, what are the price on people? It's human beings. You know, we, we look at people, we say, you know, the, the puppy in the street, or a human being in the street, we're allowed to take the puppy. The whole creation of the mountains and the forests and the seas and the oceans and the, the nebulas and the. We say, well, we're just specks. You don't really matter. Not so. There's a tremendous difference, a found difference between creation of human beings and the role of human beings in God's care of human beings and God's love for human beings and the of human beings. But to teach us a lesson. God will destroy a tree. To save a soul and save a life, God will kill animals. To save souls, God will let them die. 
And so we're being taught, we're beginning here, there's a unique relationship that God has to the beings in the rest of creation. God loves all the creation, he makes everything. But only human beings have a relationship to him, only God is to human beings in a very unique way. And in fact, we were told later that all of creation is for the sake of human beings. Finally, just simply that, that of all the things he makes, God kind of likes you best. But he other things he likes too. It's not. This is made for you. All of this was made for you. And so it's the appropriate if we look at this, this scripture, we're, I mean, we have this idea then that we're holding a territory here. It's not simply man, this wild world, and getting lost in it, and maybe it, one of the adventurers are, are, are cool enough to be, be that story. <coughs> look at the myths. People don't really matter. The heroes matter. Because they have the relationship with God, because they're the sons of God. The gods matter, even they get overthrown. Every human being matters because of the way God makes them and loves them and cares for them. It's a profound difference. And this is being told again that the, the people that we didn't hear this, I mean, again, the context was written originally, was Moses telling the Hebrew people. Wandering in the desert. God loves you and cares and made you in his own image and likeness. It's not just the Pharaoh, the son of God. It's not just, you know, the emperor who is the, who is the, who is the son of God. You as a slave are son of God. You as an infant are son of God. You who, who are, are worthless and worth nothing, tossed aside and killed, you're God's son. And therefore, you have a responsibility and a dignity and a value in the eyes of the Creator who made everything. It's extremely different. That's the story of being told. We're also told here that God is sovereignty. God deserves obedience. God has rights to giving us commands. Why? He made us, so he owns us. He's a father. The authority, the ruler, is the wise one. Right? That means, so the, who had authority in the ancient times? The kings? The elders, because they knew it was better than everybody else. You know, so if something was, was difficult, or you, know, you want to ask the elders, they probably lived through it. You know, what's the strange storm no, no, around? What's the strange, why are they coming from the sky? I don't understand it. That's snow. Put down, you know, cinders in your tires, you don't think it's crash. Okay. We're listening to them because they know better. You also want to have authority to be parents. People who are mighty, people who are able to have power, control, authority. The protectors. If you're a warrior who's going to protect you, just give his life, protect you from a marauding tribe, you have authority. Come to you and say, you know what? Listen to you, and in return, they're going to help us protect them, they go to that. And in all these reasons, God is, has a public authority. As creator, as protector, as king, as ruler, God is sovereignty, he deserves obedience. We see as well that God is just. Unfortunately, these three chapters here in Genesis, there's the fall. To have the story that with this all good God who makes all things, who loves us completely, his relationship with God, and human beings who are the jerks that we are, rebel against. And God neither ignores it and goes, aw, okay. That one would be good. Right. Now, for us human beings, we're tempted to say, well, if God let go, God ignored it, we might do a lot better. If God pretended everything was fine, and he kind of looked at it and said, oh, you little rascals, <laughs> you know, we'd be happy. It wouldn't be jealous. And it would mean that rebelling against God against what's good would be fine. But again, creation is good, so rebelling against what's good it, it is destructive, it's evil, it, it's, it's hurting everybody. And so God is justly responds. 
he also, interestingly enough, puts Adam and Eve on trial. God does not come down out of the heavens and simply say, I'm going to destroy you all, you idiots, you good people. I know what you did. God questions them. Where are you? What did you do, Adam? Why are you hiding from me? Oh, well, uh, the, the woman did it to me, and she, uh, okay, Eve, why did you do this? Oh, well, uh, the serpent tricked me. And... Why does God question? In the Middle Ages, the jurists, this is not a category back that's not coming out. In canon law, people would, the, the, the jurists, the, the canon lawyers would use the, the scripture as, as Genesis 3 to prove that everyone has the right to tell their side of the story. As a canon lawyer, I can't just listen to, you know, if you're coming to me, you, you and the, the, let's say that you and Jared come to an issue, a problem. Yeah, to decide the issue. I can't show like, like her to decide. I'm Jerry, shut up. Well, <laughs> I don't have. I can't even say, well, I know both of you, and I don't know. Uh, listen to Eve, Jerry, Jerry, what's nice? I can't do that. The right to tell both your side of the story is so important, so valuable. Even God and those old things, let's tell their side of the story. God is so just, so good, so willing to listen, he lets the condemned criminals, who we know is our right to condemn. He knows what they've done. He's not going, gee, what happened? <laughs> He's not figuring it out. He's soft. He sees all things. All things. This, is, this is like a little kid just talking over the face. <laughs> what happened to <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been Al's mom. <laughs> But the Lord still gives them the chance to say what happened. He still values and honors their dignity and who they are as their freedom and their, 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 their life, their humanity. He lets them stand trying. What your side of the story would happen. And their side of the story, the excuse they make, it's not a very good excuse. But let's tell it. This is how just God is, where he always respects our freedom, our dignity, our right to speak. Even though he's all little powerful and knows everything. He could have just said, how do it happen? Go, go. We're done. It's personal. Because even though we fell and we hurt ourselves, he promises redemption. He promises healing. As we'll find out later on, it's revealed in the stages, he himself took upon himself our burdens, our pain, our suffering, which we caused. What would the scriptures say, like Isaiah or, or Deuteronomy, this God bears our burdens? They meant it kind of with a hyperbole, sort of. But we know on the cross, it says this is literally true. This God of ours bears our burdens, literally. By his stripes we're healed. By the wounds of his cross, he carried us upon his shoulders and his back for himself. So this God is not just all, all, all just, all perfect, and willing to listen to us. He's merciful, loving, one of the saints. He doesn't have a special relationship with human beings. The dog was rabid and killed him. Goes down and says, Hey, what happened? Heaven, by the way. Tell me about this. Well, why are you so angry? Human being always has rights and dignity even when they're criminals. This is who God is. It's pretty profound. It's pretty impressive. There's a few little short little stories you could have, you know, again, you could spend. The rest of your life, pillows apart, thinking about it the second. Move on. <laughs> Questions on this? Okay. Thousands. What was that? Thousands. <laughs> Questions you want to ask? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want to ask. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what does Jesus say then about us? <laughs> oh, 
What was that? Can you show me the class, Brian? Go ahead. Okay. It did. It begins with the very first time we being introduced. The very first again, right? God, God is God introduced. He's creator. He is the origin. He's the source of all things. Human beings, image likeness of God. Genesis chapter one, verse twenty-six, twenty-seven. Made in God's image, made in God's likeness. Male and female. Okay, I'm going to try to tell you that you know, the Bible is just, 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 just full of anti women haters. No. Man, the female has different lives, divinity, same values, same school, same source, same love. What was that? It said, and our lady is above everybody except God. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. But she's not a superior man. Well, she kind of does, but that's just a good time. But I mean, like, if they say that everything's like God's against women or whatever because of the key. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> <laughs> but it begins, this, the very beginning of who we are begins with it, it in likeness. Likeness, it's not explained here. We'll see later on. Likeness refers to sanctifying grace. The spiritual quality of our soul is that his work with God in heaven. Please, God. Image refers to having a spiritual soul, intellect, and a free will. Interesting about this, then. these things have a purpose. Your intellect is to, is to, know, is to know what? Truth. Truth. And yeah, truth, good. Truth, reason. Think outside of yourself. Intellect is to know things beyond yourself. What about your free will? Pose is, it's about love. Love things beyond yourself. Love and knowledge implies relationships. First of all, with God. But second of all, with each other. We're made to know and to love. We're made to know and to love. Because who is God? One who knows all things, one who loves all things, one who makes all things. So as God's children, then, we're given this freedom to help God create. We begin this relationship with God as his children, and we share his creation. So Adam is names the animals. Whatever he names and never calls them, such that their name be. Adam's told to till the garden to care for the garden. Adam and Eve, by their sin, profoundly rock and shake all of creation. And if they had not sinned, they would have profoundly preserved and helped all of creation. It's so we're so truly and really God's children, God's in likeness, we help God create. No, we by ourselves. None of us can say that we lie, there's life. But by our free choices, by our wills, by our knowledge, we do help shape people around us, help shape ourselves, help shape each other. The first command God gives is what? Be fruitful and multiply. Through your love for each other, create children. Make new lives. Make new people. 
And this, through your free will, not simply by instinct, not simply by necessity, not simply because you're forced to, but by your free choices. Watch for the garden, watch for creation, watch love each other, help me create. Again, the place we have in creation is incredible. We manifest God's face to the entire universe because we're his children. We see in Genesis then we're created the friendship of God. It's part of this likeness. We have a profound friendship with God. God walks with Adam and Eve in the garden, he speaks to them. Genesis chapter 3 comes that he was used to do. He comes to walk with Adam and Eve in the garden. This isn't, this isn't a once in a lifetime thing. God came to talk to them in the garden. They met with God, talked to God, saw they knew who he was, spoke with him. The prophets later on, this was a rare thing, but they did. But it was through figure, through, through, through analogy, through event. Through even Christ develops his face as his divinity in the flesh. Adam and Eve saw God face to face, saw his glory in the garden. So you think, if you think about this, think of the transfiguration. Where the glory of Christ shone through his humanity, it was glorified. So that the ordinary people of other places. Moses, when he saw God's, the back of God, then God's back, his face glowed. Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden and spoke with him. They would have gone. There's a reason why they would have walked the creation, the creatures around them bowed to them. This is a baby. There's a glimpse of this in the lives of the saints. You go to St. Francis, the wolf of the bed. St. Ephraim, the wild deer would come and approach him. Many the great saints were so profound in the love of God, the wild animals would approach and listen to St. Anthony and preach, preach the fishes. This is a glimpse of Adam and Eve. They were profound great saints with spiritual gifts. They were spiritual giants. They walked in friendship with God. And they were given these profound and special gifts from our Heavenly Father. There was no other suffering. We see this with the tree of life. Death comes to the sin. This is not God's plan. Death and suffering are part of the part of the original plan. That's what God wants. That's our contribution to creation. Woo! <laughs> we did good, huh? There's perfect integrity. Integrity in this case doesn't mean honesty. Integrity in the religious sense means the perfect unity between body and soul. They were whole. Think of, think of the word integer, integer of a bit, the whole numbers. Integrity, there, there, there was a wholeness to Their body and souls are waging war. Uh, for us, you know, there are times we want things that aren't good for us. There are times we want things we don't, we don't, don't want at the same time. No, there are times when we have an, an emotion, uh, we're attracted towards something we don't really want. Isn't that interesting? Where we can, at the same time, not want something we want at the same time. Interesting, huh? How strange is that? There's something broken about us. Where we can be at war with ourselves. Different emotions about things. Where, where we can, in our minds and our intellects, I think it's a simple example, you know, a diet. You know? We want that extra piece of cake. Or three pieces of cake. <laughs> we don't want it. We want it. <laughs> Adam and Eve didn't have that war inside of themselves. They were whole, they were complete. What their intellect and their will chose, their desires and emotions followed. 
Wouldn't it be nice if you could say to yourself, I don't want to decay emotionally that much? Wouldn't it be nice if, if you could say to yourself, I don't want to slap my kid emotionally on that side of the kid? Or to say, he deserved a spanking, but I'm going to only spank him this much because I'm going to teach him a lesson as opposed to punish him. You can do that much. You can't go that far with that much. Wouldn't it be nice if our emotions and our bodies were the same control that, that uh, of our will? Well, Adam and Eve They had this perfect integrity. They were made as one thing. They fell apart with sin. They had wisdom and knowledge that were infused in them. We see this in the way they care for the animals in the garden and they name them. It takes wisdom to not know what to do with, with the platypus and to do, to do with, 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 with hummingbirds. You know, it's about the same thing. The thing is, what, when Adam names the animals, he's not simply giving a title. It's not a random title like, well, it could have been, you know, a choppy chooky instead of a duck. What's being said is, is that Adam sees their nature, their being, their reality understands them, and then names them. It takes wisdom to get a good name. The hardest part. Adam has wisdom to know what the things are, what the purpose of creation, he names them, he cares for them. He's perfect freedom. That's why there's a, there's a choice and a test. They're told, look at this tree. <coughs> Honestly, this choice should have been so easy. They walked with God. They spoke with God face to face. They had a perfect integrity that they could say, I want that tree. And they wouldn't want it to be emotional. It would have been tempted to them. They had the wisdom to know what would happen. And the freedom to make those choices. They're so free that their choice will have ripple effects on all of creation and all of the true laughter. They're so free that God himself is back and says, Help me create. They create this profound freedom, their freedom is strength. Our freedom, and sometimes, fortunately, isn't always that strong. We're, 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 our freedom can, can be uh, shortened by lack of knowledge, by his weak will, you know, where we really, really, really don't need the cake, we're not strong enough to resist it. <laughs> by bad habits, you know, if, you, if you're a drug addict or you're an alcoholic, or you drank too much one night, you're free to take choices that are wise. Not that many, perfect. And made for marriage and family. Made this relationship for love, for caring, for raising children, bringing them up in the fear of the Lord and love of God. And again, compare this then, again, those pagans, compare this with what you've been told as slaves, where, where their, their life, their existence was dependent upon the will and whim of, of another human being. You're made, you're made that you're God's son, you're like this. All these things point to the fact you are in for holiness. Have few virtues, you have made the love of God, and loves you and cares for you, and wants with him forever for eternity. Like this is profound. <laughs> Who the human beings are in the eyes of God is the story, the first two chapters. It's very, very different. Even in today's world, we don't think of human beings as very important. Now people are asking, who are reportedly very intelligent, very smart. Why aren't human beings different than dolphins or whales? How many times have you heard the people say, well, human beings, I wouldn't their virus on the earth. It'd be better if the people were to be destroyed. The Matrix. <laughs> the Matrix, the, uh, the, the Thanos, the... You know, the people just talking about it, you know, who are you know, teenagers or kids talking about it. It'd be better, you know, if half of us would disappear. Or which half? Because you another half you're in, right? <laughs> very, very different. 
We're also told then that there is these four harmonies that are made because of all this. The four harmonies, and it's not spelled out, but it's there in the background. Oh, there was a union of harmony between God and man. <coughs> so harmony with God and man. Made in friendship, made in relationship. There's a likeness. Harmony between man and man. We're made for love, for marriage, for having children. And many of our partners are selfish or angry or can't use each other. After they fall, they, her fault, his fault. <laughs> man himself. There's not a war in themselves. There's not a fight in themselves. There's not this, this, this we want things we don't want. And man in nature. This is how God makes us. This is who man is. But then comes the fall. It's not what we're from the beginning, but it affects us and really does mean something who we are. It really does change where we are. Because now, because of sin, which is rebellion, man and God are in harmony. We're separated from God's face. We leave the garden. We die. We create evil. Um, later on, the scripture comes to know us that God repents. God regrets making man. It's not literal, but it's trying to make a point. We'll talk about emotion and stuff when we get to that about next week. Um, but the, the man offends God. Can only be healed by God. More with each other. Adam and Eve are pointing fingers at each other. Cain and Abel kill each other. Almost seems like the man Adam um, blames God a little bit too for he says the woman you put here the woman you put here with me. Your fault. Yeah. 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 And, and we're and all of a sudden we're afraid of God. He'd be high. We have this friendship with God, where God is, is, is so good, He loves us, He cares for us, and we hide from Him. You don't hide from your friends. I do. You do? <laughs> <laughs> you can hide from your friends, you're scared of them. <laughs> Maybe they're bad, they're surprised. That, go, that goes to point three, or harmony three. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Because now there's anger and lust and pride and greed and, and abuse each other and, and yeah. You sick, we die, we're confused, intellect's darkened. It's hard to know things. Our will's weakened, it's hard to, 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 to reward ourselves. Now nature, now creation is a very thorny distance. You're gonna work with somebody in your brow. They return the dust of the earth and die. It's gonna be suffering in this life. Very beginning, we're told then that what God is not love, God can put man in a place, and we fell in rebel against God. That's why life is the way it is. But, but, there's hope. And there's chapter 3. Let me, before I go on to that, though, let me, uh, questions, comments? I have a question. Please. If Adam and Eve had perfect integrity. Wouldn't that keep them from sinning? I mean, they still have free will, um, and this is why their sin is such a, a bad thing. Um, and this is where Catholics do some class, goes to Bible class, and more into that. But yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, um, that's exactly why their sin is so bad, because they knew better. It was easy, it was easy to say yes. They could call upon God's help very easily, right? If they were confused or struggling or attacked, they could easily could call. I, I, either one of both of them would call upon God. And they didn't. They trusted the devil rather than God. 
Um, they, 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 they decided, they preferred to believe the devil, but it was pride. Really, the sin of Adam and Eve really was, was ultimately the one to have God's gifts, God's greatness, God's glory without them. To be like God's. Be like God himself. They weren't anywhere, but they weren't like God himself. 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 They We have this temptation sometimes ourselves uh, when we, uh, as people are, are afraid to come to God until they're perfect. We'll say, well, I, I, I can't go to confession until I take care of these other, other things. I can't come back to math until I fix this in my mind. I want to be perfect without God. Then I'll come, then I'll come to God. I wish I weren't a burden on God. I don't want to pray because I want to burden God. So what are you saying? Well, I want this by myself. I don't think I'll come to God. I'm going to lose. Sin of Adam and Eve. Sin of patience. Now, again, a little less serious because we're confused, we're idiots, we know better. I have any more. And that's why this seemingly simple sin, it appears a fruit. Like, whoa, God, chill. <laughs> that was much more. Because they called God a liar. They believed, that they believed a creature out of God. They wanted power themselves. And it was easy to say no. They knew exactly what they were doing. In the temptation of Eve, Adam's there. Adam's watching. Like, okay, cool. My wife's temp 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 tempted by the serpent. Just like I know it's wrong. Is that then to say, well, Eve, what are you doing? Okay, everyone's watching. Huh. And then Eve sends and gives it to him. He doesn't want to send by herself. He goes along because, because, because he's like, well, I don't want this to please my wife. I'm going to please her. And then please God. First instance of peer pressure. <laughs> Absolutely. They were at more of, they were at more of an advantage than we are, so it kinda of makes me think what the what, heck? Uh, we don't have a shot in hell of actually <laughs> I know, that's what I think uh, too. doing things the way we're supposed to if, if they had more of an advantage than we do and we can like you know maybe. Well <laughs> the difference is doesn't make sense. We we have Christ, who's God. Mm. We're closer to God than anyone. We have the confession of before. Okay, the Eucharist. And the fact is, too, that Adam and Eve are conserved saints. So, yeah, they messed up really badly, but they came back to God in the end. Um, traditional, so their feast day is December 24th. Mm. Um, we don't celebrate it. <laughs> 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 No, it's Christmas, Christmas Eve is the feast of Adam and Eve. Yep. Yeah, but if, if you look at, um, yeah, it was very, this, is, this is the tradition of these other signs. They were God and Adam. Like, I never heard of it, nobody says it. Yeah. yeah. But they, were, they repented. They repented. They messed up, they sinned, they fell, they repented. Well, they should because they knew what they were missing. Yeah. And they spent the rest of their life trying to do it. And they had paid for it. They paid for it by losing their children. They paid for it by the hard work. They paid for it by childbirth these days. They paid for it by the suffering of their life. And they launched them back to God. And God, after they sinned, God doesn't say, you're, you're wicked, you're gone, you're gone. He talks to them, he speaks for them. He offers sacrifice for them. He clothes them himself. If sin may brought death, mm -hmm. does that mean Adam and Eve, if they wouldn't have sinned, they, they would have just been immortal? Just, they would have just... There would have, been, there would have been like an assumption. So there would have been a certain time, would have had 80 years, 100 years in this life, whatever, 200 years, who knows. And then you would have gone to heaven, body, and soul. Oh, okay. So there still would have been a period of testing, and then it would have been over. The test would have been very, very simple. Work in the garden, which is based on anyway. You tell, you tell the rain would fall. Don't want to talk anything grow, you don't want to grow. You know, you live with God, you raise some children, teach them to love God, you see you face to face, and then you go up and send heaven, body, and soul. Wow. Okay. It's been a pretty simple, easy life. Right. Beautiful. Lovely. Very simple. Seems like human beings aren't happy unless there's some kind of turmoil or something. You know? You know yes. And, and no. they, they had it all. 
And here we are trying to work our way back home. And you know, I think that's both true and not true. I think it's true in the abstract, but not true in the reality. Um, old soldiers have been to war, they just want peace. People have actually been through hard times, they're so relieved to have boring lives. Right. People don't have, have had, people have boring lives, but we haven't had an experience. We think that we, we want to be heroes, we want to conquer things, we want to do exciting things. We don't realize what, what the joy of peace. You know, it's a Chinese curse. We live in interesting times. Mm -hmm. You said something yeah. interesting that I picked up on. Uh, that the Garden of Eden is separate from heaven. Is, is part of earth then? Yep. Yeah, part of creation. Uh, obviously been changed greatly. Uh, but, but yeah, Garden of Eden, call it paradise, but it's earthly paradise. So it's, it, it, it's a relative paradise. Um, it was not the end goal. Um, he heaven is God's home, the goal is to be with him forever. Garden of Eden was earth. Hmm. Or part of creation. Yes. Um, so after the fall, Adam and Eve could not see God anymore? Or they did, were they still able to see him face to face? Not face to face like that, no. But he's still talking. He's still, I mean, do you still talk with them? He's still, he's still um, well, I guess, I take it back. Because Judge chapter 3 does talk face to face. But it was different because, because their, their, their eyes are darkened. Um, I can't stare at the sun. But I can still see the sun. Um, and so the, the sin darkens our eyes. Darkens our like Darkens us. Um, and, and so we can't see and know God the same way. Um, and so God did not walk with them in the same way he did before the fall. But he did love them and care for them. And he was there as much as they were able and willing to be there for with him. And the obstacle is never God. Never is ever God saying, well you did this to me, I'm not coming back to you. <laughs> <laughs> It's always not. It's always us saying, I'm going to be here. Every much we come to reach out to him, God is always there, reaching out for us first. <clears throat> One last point in chapter 3, verse 15. This is worth reading. Uh, this was called by the Church Fathers, the first gospel. This is the first proclamation of Jesus Christ. The first talking about the Savior. It's called the first gospel. Or in Greek, the Proto Evangelion. Proto meaning first, I think a protoplasm. Proto first, Evangelion, like even evangelist, first gospel. Could someone read Genesis 15 for us? I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike at your head while you strike at his heel. To the woman he said, I will intensify the pangs of your childbearing. In pain shall you bring forth children. Yet your urge shall be for your husband and he shall be your master. To the man he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree which I had forbidden you to eat, Cursed be the ground because of you. In toil shall you eat its yield all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to you as you eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face shall you get bread to eat until you return to the ground from which you were taken. For you are dirt, and to dirt you shall return. Okay. Let's just stop there. Um, just point a couple things out here, just in brief. 
So verse 2020, he was finally named as uh, mother of living. Verse 21, it says, God himself makes them leather garments. He slaughters animals to clothe them. Again, you see God's care for humanity. Um, in verse 22, uh, 23, death becomes, d death is revealed. Um, and death is revealed as a way to stop and end misery. It's a mercy as well as punishment. It's a mercy because without, without death, there's no hope of salvation. The couple this book here, I will, he will strike at, at but I'm going to do with a woman, you're off screen first. So this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. This is God's, the serpent that tricked the woman, overcome Adam and Eve, had conquered them. The story is not Because God is said, I'm, I'm going to set up a war. There will be a war between the woman and the snake, her offspring. So we have in the relation of Christ coming to conquer the devil, Christ coming to crush Satan, Christ coming to be born of man. And what's beautiful and interesting is only after we see this proclamation, this promise of a Savior, that then he says to Eve, there'll be suffering, childbirth. Then he says to Adam, you'll, you'll work hard with the sweat of your brow. Then he said, there'll be death. What he's saying, therefore, is the Savior will have a mother who will suffer. This is the revelation of the cross, the sword of sorrow piercing her heart. Thorns and thistles, will, he will die, he will suffer. The thorns and thistles will be ground on bare thorns and thistles. Where are Adam and Eve taken from? The ground, your dust. The ground will bear thorns and thistles for my son. Crown of thorns, the ground of man are done against, against the Savior. So here there is a promise, it's him. But this book of Genesis is saying, I will become man, I will suffer, I will die, I will walk with you, I will redeem you, and I will save you. I will overcome the serpent. So this first three chapter of Genesis is profound. This God that all the creator makes us, makes man a special relationship with God, we sin against him, and a savior is promised. You see where this has the foundation of everything else. So the rest of the scripture is the story of how the Lord brings the power of the Savior. How the Lord, through his generations and the eons of time, plans and prepares man to be saved. Reveals who he is, gathers man to himself, unites us to himself, unites us to himself teaches us about himself, heals these wounds and these falls that are brought upon ourselves. This God of ours bears our burdens. Because he loves and cares for us and has never abandoned us. That's what the Bible tells us. If you read it simply that dissecting words, you're simply trying to sit there saying, isn't it an interesting story? Or is Adam and Eve or you miss the point? Because the point is supposed to be personal. It's supposed to make you reflect then and say, how do I think about God? How do I approach God? Do I recognize that God loves me and cares for me? Do I recognize dignity God doesn't want me personally? Do I live up to that dignity? Do I long for the Savior and cling to Him, but only Him and myself? That sounds good. It's cool. It's amazing. The Lord's good. Questions? Let's end for the night. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We glorify and thank you, Heavenly Father, for revealing, us to your, revealing yourself to us and calling us to yourself and sending your Son to redeem us. In Christ, we can do all things. In Christ, we can be saved. We trust in you, not in ourselves. All that we say undo me for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.